Good day, Strategy Gamers, and welcome to episode one of our new Let's Play series, Gary Grigsby's War in the West. Uh, we're kicking off a new title to the channel today, uh, another of the Gary Grigsby collection. Uh, we've done a lot of content so far in Gary Grigsby's War in the East 2, and after War in the West, we'll also take a stab at uh, War in the Pacific Admirals Edition, but that, that is still a ways off because that is a beast of a game to learn. Um, as with War in the East 2, I'm by no means uh, an expert in the, the community that surrounds these games is just phenomenal, and it's um, a, a wealth of resource and knowledge. So I go into this with the caveat that if you're looking for the best min-max tips, tricks to, to go through this game and the ultimate uh, strategy to win a head-to-head -head, uh, match and all that, I probably won't be able to provide that. Um, but what I can probably provide is just an opportunity for you to get into the game even as a bit of a more of a novice and see how I'm approaching some of the problems and challenges the game presents. Um, I may not touch on every mechanic that the game offers, uh, and you certainly will see that with the War in the East videos as well. While we cover much of the game, these these are truly rivet counters. And if we were to every minute detail examine in every episode, we we would have thousands of videos, and already we're going to end up with hundreds. Um, so it, take a... a pretty thorough approach to the game uh, with most of the content, but we don't necessarily touch on every every tiny detail. Um, each episode will continue to be uh, a little less than an hour long is my hope uh, to keep it right around that hour mark. Uh, we'll probably be able to do more than one turn in each of the episodes for War in the West as the, um, at the very least, the beginning of the game our, our theater is going to be of a much smaller area of operation, unlike the Eastern Front, so it's going to be a lot easier to get through content. Now, the question that we're probably going to be asking next is, okay, what are the conditions of the game? So, we're going to be playing as the Allies in this series, and I've just defaulted to difficult settings, uh, difficulty settings of challenging, and I'll show you guys what that ends up getting us. So it's pretty much setting all of the AI's attributes here to 110 and all of ours to 90. So if you think about it, you were, we're kind of giving a 10% bonus in all of these calculations and mechanics of the game to the computer, and we're taking a 10% penalty ourselves. I also have Fog of War enabled for both sides. I, I really find these games are much more interesting when there is some type of Fog of War. Um, aspect to it. We're not going to lock headquarters support, um, and it's not really relevant as they're going to be the uh, the AI, but they can technically, right, the, the East Front control is checked for them. We're also going to have a penalty if we don't establish beachheads. Um, so if we don't have beachheads by uh, February of 44 and July of 44, we're going to take these hits to our victory point penalties. Um, which can be pretty significant. So those are some of the options that we're going to be playing with. And then the question is, which scenario are we going to do? Um, so we go here to pick scenario, and we're going to do the fourth Supreme Command. Now I'm playing with the, the DLCs that are available for Gary Grigsby's War in the West. Um, and this is one that was uh, created by the community, and I, I can't... I'm pretty sure they put it into the uh, official DLC files and all of that with Operation Torch, but I, I can't be certain. I know I didn't go out and get this, so if you if you have some combination of the game, you probably have this available in your scenario list. But the, the fourth Supreme Command really is a scenario built kind of on, if you call it, the Grand Campaign, um, where it's the, the full length, it's 100 turns worth of the game, and the backdrop is that Hitler did uh, find himself uh, assassinated, as you can see here in the historical setting text, in 1943, and the Wehrmacht uh, then took control of the Third Reich, if you will. They, they stepped in, 
And back in World War One, when Hindenburg, Hindenburg and Ludendorff were, were in charge of things, they called it the Third Supreme Command. So this is the Fourth Supreme Command, because this would be the, the kind of equivalent in the next World War. And the consequences of the scenario is pretty much, it just provides more of a challenge uh, to us. And I... I, I always stress this with all of my, my series, especially this Gary Grigsby content, is I, I go into this knowing that in 40 uh, episodes, the computer might have kicked my butt. Uh, that is a very real possibility. I, I'm not going into this with any uh, level of confidence or certainty that we will absolutely win. We very well might not win. Uh, but we're going to try to challenge ourselves because sometimes if you if you have very easy settings and very easy scenarios and you you pick certain sides in some of these games, sometimes it just feels like a bit of a, a, a cakewalk and it can be a little manipulated. We we want as much of a challenge as we can realistically handle, so we're we're pushing ourselves with a scenario. And what it does is it pretty much gives the uh, Axis player the increased fuel and resources available to them, um, production on aircraft and armored fighting vehicles uh, is increased, but they're going to have fewer iterations, right? So instead of, say, the Panzer Mark IV having uh, six different versions that are ended up produced throughout the war as they continue to iterate, maybe it will only have three, just as an example. Uh, and then as a consequence, they can produce more of them. Uh, the other benefit that our opponent has is that in this kind of different historical timeline, uh, Rommel successfully evacuated much of Army Group Africa. Um, so in the Mediterranean and kind of that Italian theater, we're going to find that there are many more German forces and in much better composition, composition and strength than you would find with the traditional 1943 to 45 campaign. Uh, so all of this added together just presents much more of a challenge to the allied player. Um, cross your fingers for me. We'll, we'll see how this goes, right? Uh, so what we're going to do is just jump right into it, load the game. Ask what we want to call it, that's fine. And right off the bat, we're prompted with the air planning phase. And War in the West really uh, kind of redid how air war worked in the Gary Grigsby series of games, especially differing from War in the East, the first uh, version of that game. Well, excuse me, not the first, because there, there were a couple of prequels even to that one. But regardless, they, they improved a lot upon the air war in War in the West. Um, and maybe even that might be a controversial statement statement, but I, I, I like the improvements that they've made. I, I think the developers did a really good job with how they approach air planning. I think it's very relevant for the Western theater. I, I am not quite as convinced on how it translates to, say, the Eastern theater, but in the West, I, I think they did a really good job. And uh, we will arguably, on many turns, spend more time in the air planning phase than we might in the ground movement phase. And you compare and contrast that to the war in the East, too. Uh, because of the size of the theater, it's the exact opposite. You're you're one hundred percent more devoted to the ground campaign because of the scale of it. Here we're gonna spend probably a lot more time on the air. Now I'm I'm again by no means an expert of hey, yeah, I know I need to fly that B seventeen at one thousand seven hundred and twenty two feet for optimal performance, right? We're not gonna be getting into any of that. Uh what we will probably do most turns is uh, we will use this menu here to set kind of our priorities, right, at a very high level, right? If you pretend that you're Eisenhower and you're given a list of, okay, make 10 wishes Eisenhower and we'll make the top three happen, right? This might be a type of grid that they would use to try to process those types of decisions. We're going to start with this. Then we're going to let the AI set air directives based off of our decision. So what we choose here, it will then generate air directives. We could go in and try to create them all manually, and that would probably work. But um, I also, like I said, want to try to keep these episodes around the hour mark. I also want to get a little bit more content out there in terms of progress of the campaign instead of just an hour of you guys watching me set air directives to every minute detail. So we're going to leverage that tool that's provided to you. And then we're also going to do AI manage air 
uh, every turn. And really what that will do then is just allow for the, the coordination movement of, um, you know, what this air group from this air base to that air base, et cetera, some of that more logistical work. Um, but what we will do after that is after we've done that, we will go in and we will review the air directives and decisions that the AI has made. And then we will either accept what they've done or we'll make adjustments to what they've done. And I'll show you that once we get this all generated. So it's not like we're only going to, to do this and let the AI do everything. We are going to have manual intervention where we feel we can try to, to make sure the AI's decision align with our priorities. So there, there'll be quite a bit of intervention on our part. We're just not going to, from ground up, do every decision. Um, and the, the Air War too, I got to say, is something that I'm, I'm still learning, whereas the ground combat I probably have a much better grasp on, but we'll, we'll get through this just fine. Um, yeah, so let, I think we can just dive right in here. Um, and you see that this is broken out into different buckets. So you've got like Tactical Air North Europe, Tactical Air Mediterranean, Strategic Air during the day, Strategic Air during the night, etc., etc. So pretty much the, the air war rolls up to different air army groups and you have different air commands per theater. So there's a Northern theater and a Mediterranean and then you also have for strategic air uh, the ability to do ground attacks in the south or the north and you also have the ability to do say amphibious support for amphibious landings which is a, a critical component to this game now when you're thinking tactical think fighters fighter bombers your smaller squads perhaps right there's this one objective they're going to try to do or they're going to try to just kind of maintain air supremacy in this this defined area etc right that that's kind of the tactical aspect so in that sense you're sitting there going yeah you know what i want to hit these ferries i want to hit these airfields i want to hit these units those are the types of decisions that you're making right from a strategic perspective you're sitting there going you know what i want to just carpet and and that is a, a term that unfortunately was just so true to the word dur word during world war ii but i want to just carpet this area of bremen because i know in this area of bremen they have fuel production just to make it up right so because they have fuel production there i'm just gonna in that entire area i'm just gonna drop as many bombs as i can and we'll we'll do our best to make everything hit etc and it was a, a quantity over precision uh, type of game, if you will, or quality. So you, you can be a little less uh, finesse in your strategic decisions. You do have the option for ground attack to go to the specifics that you have in the tactical Air War II. But just remember, I mean, you're talking about a, a squadron of B-17s flying at a higher altitude, just dropping, again, a lot more quantity of bombs on, say, an airfield, as opposed to a tactical mission, which may be, you know, a squadron of fighter bombers, a little bit more agile, a little bit more nimble, doing a, a dive, bun, dive bomb run or a, a run straight towards a specific hangar, right, and, and dropping that one bomb that they might be carrying. Those are kind of some of the differences that you've got there in terms of what the, the roles are between strategic and tactical. So... Let's go through and start making some decisions. In Northern Europe at the beginning of the game, there's not much happening, right? D-Day is a year away from when this game is starting if we were following a historical line of events. Um, so looking at it, I really don't need to prioritize ground support or air superiority because there's not, um, that, that's not really as active of a campaign. Uh, the blitz over Great Britain has really started to die down by this phase. Right, and the Allies have a little bit more of air supremacy in Northern Europe than they did two years previous, as an example, or even earlier. But we still may want to go out and actually do some type of attacks. And one of the things that I'm very conscious of now that we've chosen the scenario Fourth Supreme Command is I know the Germans are going to have a lot more aircraft available to them and resources than they would otherwise. So one of the things that I'm going to focus on, especially early game, I think, is 
trying to to damage their their airfields and their air armies as much as possible. I, I really want to have that be a focus, I think, very early on. So what we're going to do is actually set airfield uh, in tactical North Europe to high, which will then change how the air directors are written, and we're going to leave it as is. I don't want to be using my planes trying to attack, say, an infantry division that's on the beaches of Normandy when I'm not going to be invading for another year, right? They're, they're going to have plenty of time to replace. Doing interdiction and such doesn't make much sense. I mean, it makes some sense, right, in terms of destroying trucks and vehicles, bringing supplies, but it's it's not as impactful, so we're not going to exhaust our airframe resources towards that. So very simply, we're just going to have them go after airfields, and the other benefit is we want them to go after airfields to try to destroy as many of their the enemy's fighters as possible, because their fighters are going to try to stop our strategic air missions quite specifically, right? And the fighters are some of the greatest threats to those missions. In the Mediterranean, we find ourselves with a much different scenario. In the Mediterranean, uh, we want to invade Italy. Uh, we're going to be engaged in active ground combat, and we have a lot going on. Uh, so you see right off the bat that we've actually already toggled amphibious support to the south on. And we're going to leave that on because we will go ahead and do an amphibious landing in turn one. Um, following the historical uh, lay of events, uh, you do have the option to, to change where your initial landings are on turn one or to, to go with an entirely different strategy. Uh, for the very beginning, I want us to follow kind of historically the landings there on Sicily. I will say, though, that for um, our, our second landings and invasion of Italy proper, for our second beachhead in uh, Europe, which historically would have been, say, the... D-Day landings. Um, I'm not necessarily as committed to following the historical on those. Uh, we're going to keep it pretty open here with what we do from a, a historical perspective in terms of where we invade. I mean, we're not going to do something crazy like a massive landing in Greece, and from Greece we'll fight our way all the way to Berlin by itself, right? We're, we're not going to be trying something like that, um, but we're not going to stick to exactly what happened historically. So in the Mediterranean, I really want to focus on air superiority because there are a number of, uh, well, air wings in the south that could inhibit our ability to advance quickly by interdiction missions and just the ground support that they can provide their defending units. So that's going to stay high. Ground support's also going to stay at medium. Um, still important, but not as much as air superiority. So I like the decision the AI made there. For... The priorities, though, this is where I'm really going to differ. Airfields, I don't want the tactical air wings to attack the airfields at all. I'm, I'm not going to focus on that, and there's two reasons why. One, a number of the airfields that would be in range for the tactical air wings to, to go after realistically, we're going to be capturing in the first two turns here. Right. So while the very initial first wave and the first seven days of bombing might yield some results there, it, it's something that we'll probably be able to overcome just by our, our ground forces movement and, and such like that. The second is I'd rather use those resources on focusing on the ferry crossing between Sicily and Italy and interdicting their units to slow down their movement as we hopefully rapidly advance. So we're going to move interdict to high, ferry to high. Port, I'm actually going to set to low. Railway will stay at low. And unit, I'm going to put to none. I, I don't actually want them interfering with, say, specific unit attacks, which would be like, you know what, we're going to do a strafing run on their foxholes to try to take out a rifle squad, right? We're, we're not going to focus on that at all. Our focus is going to be slowing down their retreat from us, and hitting some of their supplies as they're retreating and, and, well, really, I should say their resupply, because we're going to be invading, taking depots where they had supplies stored, and then as they retreat, they're going to have to then get fresh resupplied from new depots, which need to, to have trains coming in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that, that's going to be our layout here for the tactical air Mediterranean. Rail yards we're not touching at all. 
Um, if for no other reason, then there really aren't too many big rail yards in, in Sicily that we could hit. When we get to proper Europe and more northern in Italy, that might change, of course. For the strategic missions, you see it's broken out by day and night. That just reflects that historically, right, there were different missions happening during the day in the strategic air war versus at night. At night, they would just fly over the cities, and it was a, a little bit safer, right, because you, you don't have the... the you don't have fighters trying to intercept those bombers. And if they did, it was very, very difficult. It was usually just flak that was trying to shoot down those bombers at night. And they just, they tried to hit the cities in the manpower sense. And they just tried to reduce how many human beings are fighting against us in this war. And, and it had some awful, horrible consequences. And it committed by both sides. Um, it, war, war is never pretty. Um, but they, they just said, you know what, at night we're going to fly over the city and we're going to drop as many bombs as we can and as many strategic cities as we can. And that's how you ended up with those films after the war of just the Allies walking into these German cities and they're leveled, right? Just there, there was not a single roof that was standing in some of these cities. Um, and we're, we're going to keep that on high for now. We might change that as the war progresses. Because what I need to learn, I, I don't have the answer to this, right? You, you got to remember, I, I haven't done 20 of these playthroughs and I know how the AI is going to react or in this scenario. But I'm betting that as we progress, we may find that they're more well supplied in armored fighting vehicles and aircraft than we would like them to be. So we might change this to those two priorities, which will be less accurate than doing it during the day because we're we're bombing at night, right? You don't have visibility, yada, yada. But we might change that to then target cities that focus on production of these two things um, if we find that it's getting a little out of hand with, what do you know, another full panzer division of, of freshly made tanks, right? We, we might have to start addressing that. But for now, we're going to keep it on manpower um, and leave that at high. We're not going to do any type of ground attack at night. Um, so that's, that's all fine at none. During the day, uh, I do want us to focus on oil and fuel. And I'm actually going to change oil to high and fuel to low. And then I'm going to change U-boat to none. I, I know U-boats do have an impact in the game and etc. But it's given these scenario objectives, I think I need to focus more so on uh, the oil that they're getting uh, and really cut that off as early as I can, or, or damage it as much as I can early on. So we're going to set oil to high for during the day. And then ground attack in the south using strategic assets. Here we're going to focus on airfields at a high priority. And interdict I'm going to take down to none. And the only thing that I want them focusing on is how many airfields can I bomb? And one of the reasons that I'm having the strategic air do that is that with their greater range, I want to try to hit a couple of airfields that they have on the, what would it be, the, the boot, the, the shoe of Italy that aren't on Sicily, that might, might be a little out of range of the tactical air assets. Um, so that's why the strategic air is going to focus on that. All of that said and done, I think we've got our priority set for the air phase. So we're going to set air directives, and then you'll see that this starts populating those. And then we'll do AI manage air, yes. Close out of here. And now we can take a look and see, okay, what did the computer do? And, and this is our first time kind of being in the game, the user interface, looking around at everything. If you are looking for a, hey, what does this icon represent? Or what do these buttons up here do? Um, I would suggest uh, Strategy Gaming Dojo's uh, tutorial series that he has out there. He does a fantastic job with all the Gary Grigsby games of doing a bit of a, hey, here's five to ten videos of the mechanics of the game, the buttons of the game, etc. He does a really good job of them. It, it'd be a bit of a waste for me to try to take a different angle because he's very thorough, very educational on them, um, and I, I'd strongly suggest them. During this series, though, like I said, I'll, I'll continue to, as I make decisions, try to, as best I can, explain why I made that decision, why I didn't make a different one, 
what kind of my, my thoughts are around the different topics, etc. All of that I will try to be very clear on as, as we approach the, the game in the series. So what we're going to do is we're going to look and see what directives were created. And right off the bat here, we see that we have a whole bunch of tactical um, air directives that were set here on the south side of Sicily. These were all made in support of our amphibious landings, right? So they're, well, they, they were made with the intent of that, but because of how we set the priorities, they may not actually be very useful there. So here you see that we have the tactical air force doing a ground attack on these beaches, right? But our priorities, if you read the tooltip, say ferry high, interdict high, railway low, port low. Well, in the area that the computer selected here, there's not ferries. Uh, there's some railways, I suppose. We could interdict them in this area, um, but since we're invading here, uh, we're interdicting in hexes, right, that they don't really need to move through. They, they, they will need to move and retreat through these hexes over here. So let's see if we can't take this particular air directive, and we're going to try to move it up to here. So what this is going to do then is try to cause an interdict um, campaign in these hexes, which the, pretty much all these units, if they want to escape, they have to move north and then ferry across to Italy. So we're going to try to slow that progress down. And this is very tough terrain too, so it's pretty optimal to try to stop them. Not stop them, but slow them down here. These rail lines are very critical to them because that's where their supplies are coming into the island for the most part, other than a couple of ports in Catina, um, Palermo, etc. And then this is also where the ferries are. So this is where we're going to be targeting that ferry crossing. So I think we're going to, to have it set just like this. A quick note, again, not going to get into tutorial and all of that, but just if you didn't know, the green icon represents on a hex that for this air directive, you have fighter escorts within range. Purple means that you, whatever you're doing with bombers or what have you, you don't have, the, the hexes are not in range for fighter escort, right? So that's, that's the trade-off we have, and this is what I was talking about, right, where the, the tactical air force just can't reach quite as far as say some of the strategic air assets will be able to. So so this is how we're going to set up this one. Uh, now we'll go back here. Let's see what this is. So this is going to be air superiority. Um, yeah, I, I'm trying to think about that one. So this is also going to be air superiority to try to stop when they, uh, when we have a ground battle it will try to stop the enemy player's planes from providing ground support to their forces. So in that sense, it does kind of make sense to have the air superiority here because we don't want a bunch of their Junker dive bombers right along the beaches of southern Sicily going uninterrupted. We, we want to have our Spitfires and uh, such in the air here trying to, trying to intercept those. So I think we're going to leave that air superiority mission in this location but what I think I'm, yeah, you know, here, here's what I am going to do, is I'm going to move this just a little bit more inland, and then I'm going to change the area to five. So we're going to make it a little bigger. Um, and one of the reasons is that, as I'm thinking about this, right, this is covering a lot of their air bases where they do have fighters right now. And by the way, we can... These green icons represent that there's airfields where they have uh, air units, according to our last recon. You can see in that tooltip at the bottom, it says, when was our last recon? And the last time we flew over and had recon, which was this turn, or leading into this turn, I should say, we thought that they had 25 bombers there. So I think it probably makes sense. Yeah, there's 87 fighters, 23 bombers. So they're probably flying from all these directions towards the beaches. So let's have this be our air superiority, I think. So that's good. This recon mission, I think it makes more sense for us to, um, again, widen the range of it a little bit. So we're gonna change this to five again. And I'm going to change the intensity actually to low. Um, and one of the reasons is, 
I've already got really good recon. Like, I, I don't know the specific divisions or, or what have you that may be here and there and, and all of that. But if the AI behaves in any way as historically kind of happened, right, is the, the primary focus was the Italian forces shattered and the German forces, as quickly as they could, evacuate it to the northeast of the island of Sicily to try to slow down the Allied advance here and then ferry themselves across to Italy to avoid being cut off from the rest of Europe, right? Because they were under threat of, okay, is there going to be a second invasion here in Italy, which would then cut off all the forces that we have trying to defend the island, right? So recon, in that sense of what's happening over here, doesn't matter that much because most of these units will try to flee. They'll try to run away. Um, but what I do want to know is where are they setting up those defenses, I think. So I'm going to set the recon to be in this area. And again, I'm going to set it to low because the value of a recon plane will be more important five turns from now than it is this turn, I, I, I predict. And then we have this ground attack strategic, which... This is our strategic air wings. So like here you see B-17 Flying Fortresses, B-24 Liberators, um, the Halifax, the Wellingtons from the, the British, right? Um, they, they were more of a quantity number of bombs versus, hey, we flew directly to this one spot and dropped one bomb, right? If you think about it that way. So for these guys, we said hit their airfields, hit their airfields, and did I mention hit their airfields? We want to destroy their airframes before they even have a chance to, to get off the ground and attack us. So one of the regions that we want a strategic force to do this is that there are these two bases here in Italy, which I really care about, because in X number of turns, whether it be two, three, four, I'm not sure yet, we will have taken over pretty much all of Sicily. It's just, I can't imagine the AI surprising us so much that we don't easily take Sicily here. And by the way, if we don't easily take Sicily, my goodness, we're going to have a heck of a fight on our hands for the rest of this series. Um, but we'll still give it a shot. But if, given that, the strength of these two air bases will quickly become the two most important for the Germans as they try to counter our base of operations here on Sicily. So given that, what I'm going to do is change this target hex to, we want to move it a little bit more north and we want to move it a little bit more east, I think. So what if we did this? Yeah, perfect. So that gets that there, here. We still have all of these air bases that are within range. Yes. Let's do that. I like that a little better. Now we don't have this air base here, which to be fair is a larger one with 44 fight fighters as of last recon. Um, but within two turns or so, we should already have this air base captured, so I'm not too worried about that. I'm actually sitting here thinking about maybe, let's see what it looks like if we do this. What if we say, let's do this hex, I think, and then we do area, and let's cut it back to six, maybe? Yeah. We're going to change this one more time. We're going to move this up one more. We're going to change this down to five. So then really we're hitting here these two air bases, and this, this is certainly one of the largest in terms of how many fighters and bombers they have on the island. And then these, the air bases that are down here in the south, within the first turn, we might already have those captured. At the very minimum, by the second turn, we'll have them captured. So by making this decision, all we lose then is the access to bomb these two, arguably this third, right? But I like this better. So we're, we're going to go this route, I think. And I'm also looking at this, I'm going to change the intensity to high. I really want this to be a focus in bombing these airfields. So when we scroll out, we see that takes care of, yeah, it takes care of all of our air directives in the Mediterranean. What we'll do now is we'll jump up north here 
to see what is the Northern Europe uh, air directives looking at. And here we have the tactical air forces, the RAF, the second RAF, and they're doing um, recon and yeah, airfields to try to take out their fighters. So I'm not entirely sure why they chose these hexes, the AI did, for, for doing their, their airfield attacks here. Um, I think I'm definitely going to change this. And one of the reasons is for strategic air, we're going to be doing a lot of bombing towards Germany, right? Because that's where a lot of the industrial base is for our enemy. And really what I care about is providing as much cover as I can to those bombers as they fly towards Germany. And equally, the air bases that support those flight paths, um, we, we want to target those. So I think what we're going to do is look at the map here and say, okay, where's a good spot for us to instead route those tactical air wings for airfield strikes? So here we just have bombers. This is in the Netherlands. 38 fighters are there. 22 fighters are there. So it might be logical to maybe do that air, the, excuse me, the airfield attacks in this area where they have fighters. And it's also along the same path as our strategic bombers are going. So this is by Arnhem and Nshide. I did not pronounce that at all correctly. Yeah, let, let's focus on those two, I think. So we're going to hop down here, take this, change the target hex. We want it in between the two, so that would be here. And then we need to expand this out to area of three. So now it covers these three airfields. Yeah, 65 fighters. 22 fighters, and 38 fighters. So I like that a lot more. I'm also going to change this to a high priority, especially early on here in our campaign. Um, as, as things progress, right, we might find ourselves with, say, you know, we, we're, we're trying to send bomber wings that are at 50% uh, strength, right? Well, maybe it's time to, to cut back the frequency of their, their bombing runs and such. Like, we, we may eventually get to that point. I'm also going to take that recon mission that we had and equally put it over here to try to help spot, you know, where, where should we be bombing these airfields. I'm going to change this to low, though. Again, because I feel like we're starting with pretty good intel. That will change over time, so the value of the recon planes will become more important as time goes on. Then we get into these big boxes, which are the strategic bombing air directives. Um, for the most part, I kind of like how they've set these up. So when we look at it, we have the RAF command, and they're bombing at night against manpower. Uh, it should be probably all three of these, I'd bet. Bomb city, bomb city, day, night. Yep, so it's all, all three of these are night by the RAF. Um, the only thing that I'm going to change about them is I want them to be a little bit smaller in terms of their area of operation. So I'm just going to go to maybe five. Five looks good. Let's do five for some of these. So we're just going to change down the, the scope or the area a little bit. And here we'll change you down to a four. Yeah, I'm actually going to change the, the target hex there, too. I'm going to move it. Oh, what happened there? Ah, okay, so it's asking me to choose the city. Um, so we want... Oh, boy. We're all here. Oh, yeah, I can still click. Okay, sorry. 
is probably because it wasn't on one of the primary cities to begin with, and that's why it prompted that. So here we go. Now we're now we're covering Dortmund and Dusseldorf. So I think this works well. For the um, the Eighth Air Force, which is the American uh, Air Command, these guys are going to be targeting the oil and the fuel, right? That's their priority, and that's all happening in this region of Germany. These I'm going to leave just as they are because I would be willing to bet if we select them and zoom in, we'd find that there's oil production kind of spread out a little bit more here. Yeah. So each of these have, I mean, they're, they're a little low, but there's still oil production values in this area. So we're going to let them stay spread out. That's fine. They built quite a few planes there. Okay, here's where they build some of the half tracks and Panthers. Look at that. So we should really hit Hanover too at some point for the, the production they have on Panther tanks. But for now, I think that's just fine. So all of that said and done, we've now taken a look at all of our air directives. And I think we're in a position now uh, to just end the air phase and move on to the ground phase. So we're going to hit Execute Air Directives. Here's where we wait a little bit, because there is going to be quite a few, especially in these early turns, is there's the amphibious uh, support as well. Um, full expectation that we will have hundreds of losses of planes, especially this turn. And even in turns going forward, we'll probably lose two to 300 airframes a turn, or thereabouts. Um, the, the Allies, or the Americans specifically, if I remember correctly, they had said uh, before they got into World War II that they'd commit to making something like 50,000 uh, warplanes. Uh, by the end, and, and that was a laughable number at the time. I mean, that was more than just anyone had even imagined possible. By the end of the war, they built 100,000. It's just insane to think about how many they had and, and truly enough to blot out the sun, right? That, that ancient uh, story of, well... We'll blot out the sun with our arrows or, or what have you. They're going to do it with their bombers. Uh, so we're up to almost 20,000 sorties flown so far, 500 losses. What I think is really important to look at here, the Germans have lost 55 airframes on the ground. Now it's 68, it looks like. So almost 70 airframes never even got a chance to take off and attack us or bomb something because we hit them on the ground right away. I think that's really important and, and something that I'm really glad we got to see this turn. So here's a bit of a summary. What I like to look at is, so it, it breaks it out kind of by those different air commands that we were doing. So there's strategic, there's tactical, etc. But this column right here is really important. This shows the number lost um, and the number of escorts. Here it shows the number of uh, sorties or missions run, if you will. And it also says the number of enemies uh, that were lost or damaged. Uh, so you see, for example, the 8th U.S. Air Force here, uh, there were a total of 45 that they lost. Uh, here, 42, 31, so, okay, this is all good. Let's take a look at some of these bigger ones. Um, so up here, we lost 58 airframes, but look at all the damage that we did, right? So 64% of damage to the 30 heavy industry in Essen fantastic right uh looking down here 93 percent of the 25 heavy industry in dortmund was damaged so there's some pretty meaningful results from this um and one of the top ones right are the fuel and oil production right we hit those but that was just the raf bombing at night right when we go down to the eighth u.s air force and we look probably at this one i'd bet what we'll see yeah here we go so here you see 30 oil production, 60% damaged. 30 oil production, 30% damaged. Um, nine synthetic fuel production was 100% damaged in Magdeburg. Um, more here in uh, Nineburg and Braunschweig. So that was all very effective, even though we lost 100 bombers. That That really does sound like a lot, guys, but it's it's so important to just devastate their ability to produce oil and fuel. 
That is just so important to the Allies and such a critical part of the air war. When we look here, too, we also see, like, they they flew 200, yeah, about 200 for each of these types of sorties, uh, fighters trying to shoot us down, right? And they lost seven, three, four, right? So they took a number of fighter losses as well, trying to stop us from doing this. So that that's good to see. As you look comparatively, we lost relatively few fighters. We did lose a lot of bombers, though. But at least we still have the fighters, too, though, for the escorts and future ones. Another one here to look is at the tactical air force, and this is going to be the stuff we had happening on down in the Mediterranean. So you see here we had a lot of interdict uh, values and missions being run. And let's see, this was air superiority. So we damaged five, or no, we had five damage. We lost one, we didn't kill any, that's okay. But that'll come into the ground support phase of the ground action too. Recon missions ran quite a bit there. We lost, see, we only lost one recon plane, so that's good. That's good news. All right. So on to the ground phase. Um, so let's go invade Sicily, shall we? And when you start the 1943 scenario, even this 4th Supreme Command one, the AI actually already begins with you having in a number of ports in North Africa these amphibious HQs all set to go to invade Sicily, right? So we're actually just going to go through these ports and take these um, invasion stacks, right? So we're going to be landing the 231st British Infantry Brigade and the 50th British Infantry Division uh, on the beaches of Sicily. And if we look here at our amphibious map mode, we can actually see the map of where all of our landings are. So in red are the hexes that we're going to be landing amphibious assaults on. Blue is this, the hex that we're invading from, right? So we're going to go ahead and see this one's attacking right here. We're going to go ahead and invade. So that launches it. You see that they took attrition from traveling there. So if they were running uh, air missions, right, to try to intercept freight, supplies, ships, etc., they might sink one of our troop transports and we might lose 500 men, 1,000 men when that happens. That's, that's something you're going to see during this series is that as they try to intercept us, uh, what do we lose in terms of attrition from traveling those high seas? This one you see they're only taking the 5th British Infantry Division. I'll note too there's this little prep value. The higher that is, the, the stronger the, the result or your, your planning and all of that contributes to your actual landing. You do need uh, 50 and above here to actually invade, so we're going to hit Invade. Same thing, Attrition. And they go through, and now we're ready to, at the, the end of the turn here, it's going to resolve that combat. Here we have the Free French Moroccan units in this port, but they're not part of Amphibious Landing. Here we have the 1st Canadian Infantry Division, the 51st British, in British Infantry Division, so we'll launch them. For here we have the 3rd U.S. Infantry Division. They can go ahead and attack. Here we're going to send the 45th U.S. Infantry Division. And then here we have the 1st U.S. Infantry Division. Okay, so all of those amphibious landings are off and on their way. What I'm going to do now is start to position units in these cities that have these ports to try to be ready to, via uh, sea transport, reinforce uh, the invasions wherever they they may end up uh, having our units. So we're going to take these guys and toss them right here on the city. We'll also bring up the 1st U.S. Armored Division, rather famous unit from World War II in the European theater. So here we've got all of those guys. And then this is also a, a rail repair unit, so we're going to bring them up here too. The HQs we're going to leave back for now. We will bring them in, though. Here we'll bring the second U.S. Armor. Another rail repair group. 
and we'll take this 4th British Infantry Division. So then they're ready to go. Uh, looking at port size here, just 15, right? So we want ports with higher capacity to load a lot of these troops on. So the next one we're going to send them to is over here. So let's let me switch back to land movement. Start putting you guys here. Go. That infantry is not going to be able to make it. Maybe if I did rail transport, though. Yeah, I can do rail. There we go. And we'll take you, you up there too. And we've now split the 5th British Corps. Just have you come over here now. We should also come over here. Okay, so there are all those units. We can take these infantry units here to this port. Good stuff. Now we also have some airborne units here uh, that we can actually drop in Sicily to assist in the invasion. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if I need them. <laughs> that, that's my hesitation here. I'm wondering if I can invade Sicily without them and save their strength for our eventual um, invasion of Italy proper and they'll be more ready for that. That's the question I have right now. Hmm, I should have thought about this more. I think we're gonna gamble. I think we're gonna hold off on dropping any airborne into Sicily. And, and another comment there, by the way, the historical um, airborne landings in Sicily um, were not an image of success. Uh, they were in many aspects botched. Uh, it was not a smooth ride. Um, it was, you could arguably say, the, the first significant airborne invasion that the Allies conducted in any war. So it probably was destined to, to have its hiccups, but it, it didn't go great. It, it really did not. Um, so, you know, maybe we'll just, we're, we're going to skip that, and, and we're going to see, can we pull this off with just our amphibious landings? I think we can. I'm going to hop back up here to Great Britain because what I want to start doing is actually looking at units that I have here that I can start moving into the Mediterranean uh, to reinforce our invasion efforts. And not these guys aren't necessarily being brought over to say, hey, let's help take Sicily. I'm getting these guys ready for, you know what, when we invade Italy, we're going to need more men than we have down there. Um, at least I, I'm, I'm going that approach. There, there certainly is a belief of, you know, Italy was just a, a, another front for the sake of appeasing the Soviets, just to have another front to get the troops hardened before invading in France. Like, all of this different stuff that was talked about. Um, I'm not saying we're going to go into Italy and, and fight our way through the Alps into, into Austria and then into Germany. Um, but I'm also not going to ignore Italy. I, I do think it's important that we try to draw away uh, German forces from defending Northern Europe and draw their attention to the Italian campaign. So that, that is my intent, is to take it seriously. And right once we, we start this invasion of Sicily in turns two, turns three, right away what we're going to start doing in the next episodes is start looking at, okay, where do we want to invade Italy? Where are we going to try to have our breakthrough in Italy? Uh, one, to try to cut off their forces, and two, um, well, two, <laughs> if we tried to go from Sicily and just work our way all the way up through all of this terrain, it will be miserable and we'll never, we'll never make enough progress. So it's really important for us to find somewhere in Italy that we can and say, you know, this is a good spot for us to land, make a beachhead, push out from the beachhead, and then what is so critically important, race across uh, the Italian landscape here to, to cut off any forces that might have been left behind. 
then move north towards Rome, up into Tuscany, um, and then start to at the very least make the Germans fear us getting to the Alps and pushing through. There's also Corsica, Sardinia, all of that, that that needs to be discussed too, but those are sort of future episode considerations. So let's go ahead. Um, trying to think if I forgot anything. I don't think I did. Let's go ahead and end this. I did forget something. So I brought all these units over here to start getting ready to ship off to the Mediterranean, but I never actually shipped any of them to the Mediterranean. So we're going to take this stack of Canadian units, and if we have the movement points for it, I think we will, yeah. We're going to sea transport them to this hex, and this then sends them to the Mediterranean uh, next turn. So we're going to go ahead and do that. So the next turn, those units will be uh, in North Africa, kind of ready to go. Let's... Is that the right HQ to take first? It's not. Probably the Canadian one here is the best next thing to take. Yeah, and that's the Canadian army, so it's fine that they come a little later. So this will be the next stack that we move down there next turn. Okay. Yeah, I think now we can end turn. Let's see how this goes. So we're going to get to see exactly what happens here with our amphibious landings and what that all looks like. First, we have to go through the, the German logistics phase, though. Really glad we're finally getting to do a Gary Grigsby War in the West. I've, I've really been looking forward to this ever since War in the East, too. I, I fully dived into and started doing the videos on. So looking forward to, to now having a new theater, talk about some new history, some new decision-making. Oh, okay, let's jump right into it. So... The very first attack here, and this was with General Bradley, was successful. Um, here we see the Italian forces um, surrendering and just really retreating uh, as we move into the city. In the south here, again, defending forces retreated. Good news. Here we get into the, the British forces that are landing. Defending forces retreated. Here the Italian brigade routed. Good. All right, and we were also successful here. So it looks like all of our amphibious landings were successful, which again is kind of expected. Um, but now the the next question is, will we be able to to break out and push as aggressively as we could historically? The the wild card, the unknown here, is just how strong is that army group Africa that was retreated successfully in this scenario? Um, how much of a difference does their increased supply uh, make in the Sicilian and Italian campaigns? That Those would be the questions. This is their air directive phase. You see they have significantly fewer sorties than we had and that they've lost 150 airframes. We've only lost 50. Right? So although it was very one-sided in our turn, you do see it's never, it's never going to be a one-for-one -one trade between the Allies and the Axis in the air war here. Um, but it gets a little closer when you consider that when they try to do their bombing runs, when they try to do their interdiction and all that, we have a little bit more success against them. They're actually counterattacking right on the beaches here, uh, trying to push us back into the sea. Quite unsuccessfully, I might add. They're not even really getting close. I mean, they're attacking 15,000 men with 1,300, and they're Italian forces that are probably underarmed, low morale, shocked that all of this is happening, etc. That is a big caveat, though, too, is just not knowing the Italian forces. How would they respond to an invasion, right, of Sicily, of Italy? Um, what would be their morale and their psychology of it all? Because I mean, it's one thing to go off into Africa and, and fight and uh, partner with the, the Germans against the Allies in, in North Africa in a desert, right? But when it's Sicily, when it's Italy, how would they have responded? Um, and, and here we see that we, we triumphed over them in this initial turn. Which was expected. Okay. So we've gone through the turn simulated. I know I led with, hey, we're going to probably have more than one turn per episode. That still holds true, but we had probably 30 minutes of background in this episode, setting the game up, what were we going to be looking for in this series, etc. So 
I, I do expect that for the next episode we'll go over turns two, and at the very least portions of three, if not all of turn three, two. So looking here, we don't have the same end of turn summary as War in the East 2. It's just kind of a ground losses summary that we get to see. So it breaks out the specific units or squads or what have you that were actually lost. Um, and you see that during this turn, there's this column, then you have a running total that it's going to keep track of. So we lost 410 vehicles, right? Um, they lost 63, uh, they, 157 right from the, the rifle squads, etc., etc. Over here, just kind of aggregated numbers. You see men, guns, armored fighting vehicles, the same thing that we see in the other Gary Grigsby games, breaking it out into those three segments. Here's how many the Axis lost. Here's how many the Allies lost, right? So overall, very first turn, very, very beginning numbers here, but things look good. Uh, we can also filter this to air losses. Uh, so you see the number of pilots that were killed, the number of fight or the number of airframes by type that were lost in the turn, and then again the running total. And then you can see the specific models over here. And then for destroyed units, uh, this would be trying to break out very specifically, like um, in Syracuse in southern Italy, these specific AA gun battalions were um, disbanded pretty much because we took over the city. Right, they were embedded in the city, but when we took it over, we didn't even really probably say, "Hey, we're going to keep using these." We have, they'll have their own. But so those units are just now kind of gone. So that's the end of um, turn one and the end of episode one. Um, as always, guys, thank you for your support of the channel and of these Gary Grigsby games. Uh, they are a series that deserve a lot more attention and support than I feel they get. I have had an absolute blast getting to know them. I really look forward to having you guys come along with me in this Let's Play series of War in the West. It's nice to get some, some new content titles out there for you guys, too. And as always, if you have any questions, comments, feedback, please drop them down below. Um, you know me, I, if you've got a piece of advice or you, you know what you... You were a bit of a moron for doing that in episode 17, right? Go go ahead and tell me. I'd, I'd love to, to learn from the comments, so then I can also try to share those with the, the viewers as well and, and learn a little bit more about the games too. So I appreciate all the interaction and support you guys provide there. And the same thing as always, guys. Well, actually, same thing as always, Strategy Gamers. Hoping you have yourselves in. Excellent day. Bye now.